Hello and welcome to the Friday, June 2nd, 2023 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. SSL version 2, I think it sort of uh, wasn't supposed to be used uh, anymore around sort of Y2K. That's sort of when some obvious vulnerabilities became known in SL version 2 and it started to be removed from server configurations. And yes, I'm talking about SL version 2, not version 3, which of course hang around a little bit uh, longer. So Jan looked into, well, how much SL version 2 is there still around and turns out there is still a little bit around, not a lot really sort of in the one percentage kind of range we still have uh, sl of version 2 probably mostly sort of legacy systems uh, iot devices and uh, probably a lot of devices also that people just have totally forgotten about kind of amazing that they stayed alive that long and well that's really life in it as jan explains as well here that there are are some of these vulnerabilities that are just sticking around forever. And should you run across a web server that only supports SL version 2, then you may actually have a difficult time connecting to it because SL version 2 is no longer included as an option in modern TLS implementations. But let's move on from 25 plus year old vulnerabilities uh, to some newer issues. Kaspersky published a blog post uh, with uh, details regarding a uh, new iOS malware that they have observed installed on many different iOS devices in Russia. The discovery originally happened via network detection. Of course, there's not much that you often can do on iOS devices on the endpoint. Uh, so network detection is uh, really important here. Kaspersky states that the attacks may have started as early as 2019 and they have seen current additional attacks happening. So this is an actively ongoing attack. The latest version of iOS they have seen being exploited is 15.7. So this is not the latest version. The latest version is 16.5. As many of the sort of more sophisticated uh, pieces of malware, this one also takes advantage of a zero click exploit, meaning that the victim will receive an iMessage with an attachment, but the victim does not have to actually open or interact with the attachment. Just receiving the attachment itself will execute code and then follow up infections or follow up code is then being downloaded from various command control servers until the phone is completely rooted and connected to a command and control server. This activity appears to be limited to Russia at this point. Of course, Kaspersky's view is also Russian centric, so they may not necessarily see what's happening with this kind of activity in other uh, areas of the world. They do even briefly, uh, but kind of nicely describe the methodology they used, the tools they used in order to download, for example, a backup from the phone and then analyze that backup. Since again, you can't really on a modern iOS device sort of interrogate the device directly. And Progress, the maker of a popular file transfer tool, MoveIt, uh, announced that they're seeing active exploitation against a thus far unknown vulnerability in their MoveIt transfer product. MoveIt transfer allows you to upload, download, and distribute files. That's sort of what it's all about. It's often used sort of by enterprises to kind of manage file transfers like that. The vulnerability apparently is exploited via HTTP and HTTPS. There is uh, no uh, patch available right now. Transfer just announced that they're working on a patch, but I haven't seen actually anything being released. And their recommendation thus far is to just disable HTTP and HTTPS. Disabling HTTP and HTTPS, of course, has a number of side effects, like for example, the REST APIs will no longer work. But given that there is a 
public exploit available and it's actively being used, you probably don't have uh, much of a choice here. The advisory also notes how to detect if your instant has already been exploited. And then we got a new vulnerability in the report lab Python library. This is a library that creates PDFs from HTML input. So often used as part of web applications. It had a vulnerability back in uh, 2019 that basically allowed arbitrary uh, command injection. It was fixed back then by introducing sort of a safe eval function to basically execute code in sort of a sandbox. Well, uh, the problem is that uh, this safe eval function isn't perfect. Common problem if you're trying sort of to allow a limited code execution and that's being exploited here. A proof of concept exploit is available. The CVE number for the vulnerability is 2023 33 and well, it's Friday. We haven't had it in a while, but I have with me an other sans.edu student. Brandon, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm Brandon Helms. Basically, I have roughly about 15 years of different critical thinking security background. Started out in submarines. I learned a lot of great things about submarines. One, radio waves don't propagate underwater. So when things break, which they break often, you don't have the Googles or Stack Overflows. I then got this awesome opportunity to go work with the NSA doing really cool stuff. Ultimately, I got to work with some amazing people and I decided to leave the public sector to go see what the private sector had to offer. Over my tenure of the last probably five to 10 years, I got to really focus on security for both organizations um, and for personal hygiene. And in our talk today, we're going to be talking about threat intelligence for containers because the last three companies I've worked with or for, they all seem to be deploying containers in a similar way. Yeah, containers is certainly it. And first I thought maybe your submarine background got you into containers, kind of. <laughs> it's a little bit similar. Your paper was about threat intelligence and containers. Uh, what's special when it comes to containers and threat intelligence? I think when it comes to containers, the most special part of it, at least to me, because I also wear a developer hat from time to time, is the ability to produce reproducible code fast and efficient. So if I'm testing something out, I don't have to wait 30, 45 minutes for a build to happen. I don't have to work off of gold images. I literally have this container that I can drop my code into, run it. And if it works great in my staging or QA environment, then it has a high probability of working in my production. Also, when it comes to services that have containers built for them, there are so many. I think Docker Hub has, what, over 10 million um, different containers. This is where the problem comes in, which is whenever I need a container, I don't really use my security hat to make that determination. I typically make it off of, I have a need, such as I want something like Nginx or I want some other service in my environment. Which one has the most downloads? Okay, that's going to be the one I trust. Which one does Docker Hub say is the most trustworthy? based off this being an official version, right? And then when I started actually running some security tooling or doing some uh, threat assessments on these containers, I realized, wow, either these organizations don't know how to build containers in a secure way, or they themselves haven't been taught um, about the threat intelligence side or the vulnerabilities that reside outside of just the regular software dependencies. Yeah, so the advantage is kind of that you wrap your code and all dependencies kind of in that container, uh, getting you that more reproducible result. But uh, with that, is there a higher risk of ending up with stale code too, with stale dependencies? Because you, know, you don't necessarily keep them up to date uh, on a continuous basis. Once you build it, it's sort of frozen. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point to bring up right away, which is um, it can be very easy just to keep adding and adding and adding. Most times as a developer, you don't update something unless it's broken or unless an uh, ethical hacker says, hey, I found this vulnerability here. I think with the improvements to things like GitHub and introducing like Dependabot, um, it makes it a little bit easier. But I can even tell you that I can look at a lot of my enterprise repos that I've worked on and I see 50 to 1,000 Dependabot things that tell me I need to update a dependency. And I just sometimes ignore them. Once again, when I put my security hat on, I'm like, that's a huge no-no. But absolutely, to your point. Do you usually recommend updating just if there's a new version or only if the new version actually has a security issue? 
Great question. I think this is a, a good business decision. Uh, for businesses that are more security conscious, I would say try to run as close to the latest version as possible. I'm not a big fan of running containers with dynamic tags because it really makes it hard um, to roll back if things are broken. But I do like having a, a risk assessment um, where the development team looks at their image every weekly, every month, every quarter at least to say, hey, am I on the latest version of Node? Am I on the latest version of Python Container X? Um, and then having good tools inside your environment that can say, hey, um, your container might be outdated, but it's good from a vulnerability management standpoint. It's good from a threat management standpoint, and it's still supported by the vendor. You're good to go. When you scan your containers, do you usually have to start them up or can you just uh, basically scan the, the configuration files for it? Great question. Um, it really depends on what you're looking for. So even with containers, there is definitely a static component and a dynamic component. So one of the cool parts about the static components of a, of a container is they're built in layers. So each layer is going to essentially be an action that's going to be always produced on that container. And in this, you can see kind of how the beautiful mind of the engineer that built that container was thinking, such as, do I have to run dependency managers such as apt get, apt update? Do I need to make sure I'm doing like a brew install? Um, what commands am I running or applications am I running ahead of time? What ports am I exposing? So these are great uh, quick stabs from a static analysis point on how was this container built? Also, all containers tend to be built off of a reference. So your first one might be Alpine or your first one might be Ubuntu. Um, so that gives you a good understanding of where the base comes from as well. On the dynamic side, um, you typically do have to load it up. So things that I look for, at least from a threat intelligence um, or even just as a security awareness is as soon as I try to run a command and in the container, what user am I? I can't tell you how many times I get on these containers that are supposed to be super secure and I'm root, right? And when you start looking at, oh, if I'm already root, do I even need to worry about privilege escalation since I'm already root? Like, cool, check. That's good for an attacker. Um, then the next piece is, can I actually install or download things? Is the container itself immutable? Meaning that there's no right attribute applied to any file on there. I could tell you like, at, put my attacker hat back on. If I don't have privilege access, if I can't write to disk, it's gonna make it really hard for me to lay down any forms of persistence and even to complete some of the exploits. Um, and then the last piece of it is, why am I seeing shells on these containers? We shouldn't be SSHing into these containers to do work, right? You should just be loading your applications. Your applications should be running. If you don't have a shell capability, you know how hard it is when you pop and you're trying just to run a simple LS or a simple PWD. It's like, oh, shell doesn't exist. So now as an attacker, I have to put all this in shell code. And now I have to make the exploit even more complicated. And eventually I'm just going to move on to somebody easier. As sort of a developer myself, uh, of course, I always run into that little issue between sort of you know convenience and security here it is sometimes really convenient for debugging to be able to get a shell on a container you mentioned some of the base images like alpine and ubuntu and by using a more restrictive a smaller base image do you see significant security advantage improve security in a worthwhile manner that makes it worthwhile giving the lower convenience of having less tools in a container I can tell you that is the pain point I, I, I struggle with with organizations, right? If I put, once again, if we swap between dev and security hat, right? The security hat comes out and says, you know what? Why don't we use a container that has next to nothing on it? Like Google's distro list is like a great example of there's next to nothing on this container, right? And this is a great starting point for security because now I'm going to have to push everything on. I'm not going to be able to download packet or package managers and run all this, but now let me swap out to my developer hat, right? Um, it's really hard if I, if I have like Node in my environment and I just wanna have all these Node install scripts, right? All these Node dependencies so that when it boots up, I just say Node install and it just installs everything. So being able to balance um, the security and then the ability for the developer to produce, because at the end of the day, the developer has to provide business value and removing as much friction as possible is kind of what I strive to do and ultimately, I tend to err on, let's have a finite set of trusted base images in our organization that we can build frameworks for our developers to work out of. Okay, and uh, 
you know, just to round out a little bit of developer discussion here, do you think developers should be included in some of these threat intelligence discussions? So by making them aware of some of the threats that they better understand why some of these restrictions are in place? Absolutely. I think this goes back to the business's culture. I think um, as a security team, yes, you should have that October security awareness month. Absolutely. But I also think that there should be onboarding with developers that are can be that are going to be building applications using security. They should know like, hey, this is just like the TLDR. This is the 90 second uh, presentation of security things you should think about. Ultimately, I'm a big fan of trusting um, organiza- or teams to make great security decisions as long as they know that they can come to the security team for advice without feeling like, oh, I'm going to be slapped by the security team because they're going to say this is bad. Yeah, great. So what's next for you? Are you almost done with your Sansa EDU program or uh, where are you at here? Absolutely. I just finished. This, uh, just was, finished. Good. this was my last piece of it. So I officially now have my master's in information security engineer from SANS Technical Institute. Amazing program. I can't recommend it enough to people. I think it's great for a zero to one, but I think it's also great for some of us that's been in the industry well before programs like this existed because it helps us just fine tune what we know and helps us with standardizing it. Um, And then right now I'm working with a company called Cradle.ai. Basically, I've, as everybody knows, this thing called AI just hit the scene like on a V3 scale about a few months ago. Now everybody wants a piece of it. Um, But working at organizations, I'm still seeing people be like, oh, let me just drop all my code into the LLM. Let me have it just scan up, right? And they're not taking any security ramifications such as, is there PII? Is there HIPAA data? Is there static secrets in there, right? So working with this uh, team to build a more secure way for people to be able to use AI without worrying about whether or not their data um, gets sent to a training model. Excellent. Thanks for joining me here. And uh, thanks everybody for listening and talk to you again on Monday.